one of the most moving scenes in the gospel is the well-known story of how Mary Magdalene came and poured out her tears at the feet of Jesus when he was a guest in the house of the, of the Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee. Magdalene was a woman of, with a bad name in that place, and the Pharisee was the reputable man and he invited Jesus to a meal. Evidently guests could, or people who were not invited, could come and have a look at what was going on uh, and that was why Magdalene came in like that to the feet of Jesus and we know that scene where she poured out her tears at his feet, wiped them with the hair, her head, kissed his feet and anointed him with oil. While this was going on, Simon the Pharisee thought to himself, if this man knew what kind of woman she is, he would not allow her to touch him. Jesus realised what the Pharisee was thinking and he said I have a question to ask you there was a man who was owed money by two people one owed 500 the other owed 50 neither of them could pay and so he forgave both then Jesus asked which of the two do you think would love that man more Simon had not much choice but to answer, I suppose, the one who was forgiven more. Then Jesus said to him, I came as a guest in your house. You did not give me the kiss of peace. You did not wash my feet, as is our custom. You did not anoint me with oil. This woman, with all her sins, has poured out her, washed my feet with her tears, she has kissed my feet and she has anointed me with oil. I tell you, her many sins are forgiven. And he simply said to the woman, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. It's one of those events that points to the very heart of the gospel. The it shows us how again and again in the gospel what Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first. In the eyes of everyone in that story the success person in the whole story was the Pharisee. He was reputable, he was a well-known man, he was... Uh, everybody looked up to him and said there's a great pillar of society. The success in the eyes of the world and here, in the meeting with Jesus, he comes away as the one who's got it wrong. He comes the way, uh, comes out of the meeting with Jesus uh, as the one who's not a success. And the woman, Magdalene, who in the eyes of everyone there was of no reputation, woman of ill repute, loose life, she comes away from the meeting with Jesus uh, as the success. The Gospel is full of, as we saw before, the Gospel is full of Jesus meeting people. He's always meeting people. And nobody meets Jesus and comes away the same. In a way, it's, uh, the, the, it's, it's rather risky meeting Jesus because you, it's dangerous. The, the wounded and the sick and the paralyzed and the blind and the lame, they come away from the meeting with Jesus healed. The sinners come away from the meeting with Jesus, their sins forgiven. The troubled parents with their children lost come away restored, changed, the whole situation. It goes the other way too at times. The ones who are strong, the ones who are uh, fully assured of themselves, confident of themselves, pillars of society, 
the Pharisees, the scribes, they come away from the meeting with Jesus uh, generally hardened of heart, closed. They don't open themselves. And so the meeting with Jesus is crucial for those people in the gospel and for all of us. We too are constantly meeting Jesus. We meet Jesus in our retreat. We meet him in the Eucharist, in the sacraments, in reconciliation. We meet Jesus in the word of God, in the, in, in, in the scriptures. We meet him in prayer. We meet him in each other. We meet him in the poor. And the way in which we we can't come away from any of these meetings the same. Either we come away rejecting or we come away open and having received him, touched by him and, and transformed. Even if, we, even if we sort of come away indifferent, that is, we're not the same, we're changed. So the meeting with Jesus, and we see it here in this incident there with Magdalene. She, who was the woman of ill repute, a sinner, comes away, her sins forgiven, and drawn into the discipleship of Jesus. We will find Magdalene from this time on uh, among that group of women who are the, the closest followers, right up to the cross. There are not many of the disciples of Jesus left on Calvary. Uh, there's just a tiny little band Mary, his mother, and a few women, including Magdalene uh, and John the Evangelist. Not many more. But this, uh, this uh, Magdalene is there, the one who everyone condemned or wrote off, she's no good. And this is, uh, this is where the, the gospel of Jesus, it's good news for the poor, but it's bad news for the, for the self-assured or the self-sufficient. And that, of course, is why Jesus ends up crucified. Because the, the ones who took their stand on their own righteousness, uh, they, were, they saw that uh, the ground was cut from under them. And they had to humble themselves. They had to recognize that they too were, were in need, that they too were lacking, as this man didn't even give Jesus the ordinary, customary marks of welcome to a guest, of hospitality. Relied was sufficient unto himself. And this is what Jesus does. Here, and, and so many stories through the Gospel, it's the same thing. The story of the parable he taught of the prodigal son, the two sons, the one who got the whole thing messed up and you know, failed, uh, went off, wasted all the heritage in loose living, in the end he comes back and is, is, is welcomed by his father. His elder brother, who stayed home, never did anything wrong that we're told about. He could not accept that his brother would be received back. And he's the one who ends up, uh, ends up the failure. So this somehow the touch of Jesus, the meeting with Jesus, turns things upside down. The people, the community of Jesus is not the religious establishment of the time. The priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the doctors of the law, they're the ones who crucify him. And the community of Jesus, as we see in the Gospel, uh, it's, it's given very plainly, the publicans, the sin sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. This, uh, this is where the gospel is so hard to take and this is where Christ gets crucified. And this is where the gospel uh, again and again gets denied. Jesus is too much for us. And the st it still goes on. Um, the thing gets twisted around. Uh, the poor don't get in to all the celebrations and the, the feasts and the celebrations. Uh, the rich and the mayor and the prime minister and the, the prominent people, they're the guests who are invited to all these things. Uh, and the poor, the little ones, wouldn't get past the gate. That is not the gospel of Jesus. 
I remember in Vietnam, there was a, not long before Saigon fell, there was a priest who was in charge of the relief services. He was a parish priest also. And he was made a bishop. And for the, for the celebration after the, he was install, uh, consecrated as bishop, he did this. He invited the people he invited to the feast were all the people that used to come for, uh, for food handouts and uh, relief supplies, the beggars, the blind, the lame, the poor. And it, everybody was, was shocked. But it's, Jesus says it very clearly. When you have a feast or a celebration, don't ask your friends, don't ask the prominent people. There's nothing in that. Ask the poor and the beggars and the blind and the... That man did it and it was a very powerful thing. So this is the revolution of the gospel. And it's, it's still too much. Just the other day a, a woman was telling me, she said, you know, in, in our parish, you don't get on the parish council unless you've got degrees. Hmm? Huh? And when you look, it's, it's, it's so true in many, many places. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not the gospel. Huh? And all in the name of enlightenment and uh, uh, modernity and God knows what. We don't realize how easy it is to become a Pharisee and build up that little inner clique and inner group uh, of the privileged uh, minority. Uh, the establishment, the Pharisees. Huh? The gospel gets lost so easily. And Jesus comes and he, he turns it all upside down. And uh, that's where the gospel is always in trouble with the world. And uh, so much of, of scripture scholarship, uh, it has to explain these things away. You know, the, the whole infancy of Jesus, the way in which he comes among us. Nazareth, Bethlehem, no room at the inn. Uh, you know, it's the picture of poor people. They, why is he born in Bethlehem? Because they have to go there, it's the time of the census. Everybody has to register in the town of their ancestors. And for the Joseph, the house of David, that means Bethlehem. Just at the time when the baby's to be born. And they have to go. You know, if they had any influence or power in society, uh, they would have been an exemption for them. You wouldn't have the... Uh, the, the privileged people or the well-off, they wouldn't have to go. They'd, uh, it'd be done somehow or other. But Mary and Joseph had to go just at that time. And when they get there, Bethlehem's crowded. And just that one little line in St. Luke's Gospel, there was no room for them at the inn. Says it all. Uh, says everything. No room at the inn. Why no room? Because they were, they were little people. They were not important. They were poor. If you've got money, if you've got it, there's always a room. So the gospel is a pains there to give us these things. And, and so much of scholarship, scripture scholarship says, oh, that's just... Uh, scripture scholarship says, you know, that's all uh, just story or poetry or this or that. Uh, it, uh, it's not, it, it didn't really happen that way. You know, it didn't really happen that way because it's too darned embarrassing. It's like I said yesterday with Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, the politicians of the day, they, they don't want to be reminded of Gandhi in India because he lived with such simplicity and poverty. And it shines up their own, the way in which they live themselves with all their uh, perks and corruption and, uh, and dishonesty. The... Uh, it's told there the, um, in the gospel again we have the, uh, that they were poor when Jesus was the baby was presented in the temple the offering of Mary and Joseph was the offering of the poor there can be the offering of the pigeons there's the offering of the sheep or the goat there's the offering of the ox and that the rich would offer the oxen the middle I suppose would offer the sheep and the goat and the offering of the poor was the, was the two pigeons, the two, the two, two. That's what Mary and Joseph brought. Uh, they, were, they were poor. And that, uh, all that's denied, or that's just some sort of a poetic story, it, uh, not really that way. Uh, because the reality is too embarrassing. 
it's too uh, and so the gospel there is always giving a place to the poor to the little ones and it's it's hard to swallow you know Jesus and the gospel is not really about making women priests it's about making prostitutes saints and it's it's about making the the people who are looked down on giving them a mission giving them a role this is the revolution of Jesus and it's for the poor it's not the poor aren't asking to become uh, get on the parish councils or to be ordained as uh, priests or they're not asking for these things uh, it's but Jesus is for there's a place for the poor and the the established the the privileged even the educated Jesus was not crucified by the poor he was crucified by the professionals uh, and that's uh, that's always the same way because he's too much unless the professionals are, are humble and simple as many of them have been and many of them are then all their gifts and all their talents are incorporated into the beautiful uh, witness and, and life of the gospel the life of Christ but if it wants to become a privilege if it wants to become an establishment if it wants to be a little inner power clique then it's got nothing to do with the, the gospel except that uh, it probably ends up crucifying uh, Jesus so you know it's uh, the gospel is not just a, not just a story uh, it's tremendously real and of course the good news about it is as I said it means that if I'm a sinner like Magdalene if I'm poor, if I'm a hard-working manual fisherman like the, the, the Galilee people, Peter and James and John and Andrew, if I'm a tax collector with a shady sort of a job and a shady sort of a background, if I'm a prostitute like Magdalene, the gospel means Jesus has a place for us. Not just sort of putting a stamp on our foreheads and saying okay you pass but calling us into the very heart of his uh, of his mission all these people became apostles they became disciples they became people with a uh, with a tremendous role in the proclamation of the gospel and the good news of Jesus uh, it's the church of the sinners and of course that's that's good news it, it, it means that we all have a place you know if we all had to be uh, you know without any any spots or stains or uh, in our story you know how many would be left uh, we there wouldn't be too many of us but he comes it's not the sick it's not the healthy who need the doctor he says it's the sick the infirm and this is where we all get in and he gives that dignity to us he gives a role to the little people and of course that's why you look at church history and we can see all the things that have gone wrong all the scandals all the mistakes uh, all the things that are thrown up at us these days where does all that come from it comes because Christ establishes his church with human people there's in the church there's the divine element and there's the human element and God himself chose to build the church he could have done it with angels and archangels and he could have sent armies of angels to to do it all he didn't he chose to make his church with with people and we have the picture there of the twelve apostles in the gospel and they were a they were a very mixed bunch and they made their mistakes they got it wrong one of them was Judas who betrayed him one of the twelve handpicked by Jesus Judas who betrayed him Peter the leader who denied that he even knew him to the young girl the others all ran away and abandoned him and left him 
Others were fighting, John and James were squabbling who was going to be on the right side and on the left and get ahead of the others. Uh, Thomas uh, couldn't believe in the resurrection, wanting in faith. So, you know, it doesn't... And Peter, they loved to show Peter in his, through the Gospels with his mistakes and uh, everything. So the Gospel doesn't, and just as the Old Testament, brings out even King David, who wrote all the Psalms. The beautiful Psalms we sing, read the story of David. There's some pretty awful things there uh, that, that David did. And that runs right through it. So church is going to mean, disciples of Jesus means a mixed lot. So, you know, you can't get up and sort of say, well, you know, that priest's like that or this priest uh, drinks or... Uh, of course he does. He's, uh, there, there's human people. And that's the hypocrisy of the in a way, of the, uh, of the media today who, who, who delight in... We've had Brides of Christ uh, for the nuns, we've had the thing on the priests, uh, we've had the thing on the brothers, you know, uh, one after the other. And they... You know, the, nobody ever does a 60 Minutes program on the media, you know, and their carrying on and what goes on beside the scenes there. You know, there's never a, a word there. But, uh, but anything else. So we, um, that we, um, we, ha uh, we need to recognize. The human element is there. And that's, that's built into it by, by our Lord. And not to be, not to be, I think the saddest thing is when we hear of people saying, oh, I don't go to church anymore because the priest uh, did this or he does that or he drinks or he womanizes or he does... That, that human element, we have to be able to accept that. And this is the thing with the sacraments. You know, sometimes, uh, for various reasons, people don't go to church. They're really depriving themselves of Christ. You know, it has always been the teaching of the church that the sacraments bring their grace not through the holiness of the minister, the priest, that, but rather that that a sacrament is the action of Christ and the grace is built into the exercise of the sacrament. When you go to communion, to mass, or when you go to confession, if it's, if it's validly done, that is, according to, the, uh, to, to what the Church says, the words of consecration are there, correctly said, there's bread and wine and the minister is ordained, you are there at the sacrifice of, of the Mass of Christ. You receive the body and blood of Christ. The priest may be, uh, he, he, you may not like uh, the way he does it. He may, be a, uh, he may be in a state of mortal sin. But if he's a validly ordained priest and he does what he's supposed to do over the bread and wine, uh, you receive the body and blood of, of Christ. And that's, that's the grace that God, that Christ gave to the sacrament. You know, if you, if, if the fruit of the sacrament depends on the, the holiness of the priest or whether he's in sin or not in sin, you know, you'd never know. You'd, you'd never be sure. You'd be in awful trouble. <laughs> but uh, that's the providence and the mercy of, uh, of, 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 of Christ. And this is not new teaching. It has always been. I, I learned this when I was uh, doing theology before the Vatican Council. The teaching, uh, and they speak about ex opere operantis or ex opere operata, that whether the fruit of the sacrament comes through the, uh, through the holiness and worthiness of the priest, the minister, or whether it comes through the, the sacrament of which the priest is the minister and to which Christ himself has given the fruitfulness and the efficacy. And so it, it's really sad today when people don't go to church because they, it's the mass is, the priest is not doing it in the way they like or they feel that he does it this way or that way. Uh, they're really depriving themselves of, of the body and blood of Christ. They're depriving themselves of the forgiveness uh, of the sacraments in, in, in reconciliation.
and we, 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 uh, that's too much to, you may have to shut your eyes to some of the goings on, or you may even have to uh, block out the, the homily, or you may feel you have to stop putting anything on the collection plate, uh, all that okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, but don't ever deprive yourself of receiving the sacrament uh, which is Christ himself, whatever the sacrament might be. What we, what all this, uh, another hopeful aspect this gives to us and I think it's very relevant in our church today where there are many people today, many Catholics today who who are drawn to to a spiritual life, to prayer, to a, a desire for a, a deeper spiritual life, who belong to prayer groups, charismatic groups who are moved to to works of caring and love and compassion for the poor and the underprivileged. Uh, there are many people who are looking and searching today for vocation. Sometimes for various reasons they, uh, unlike in previous ages, there were the religious orders and the seminaries and it was pretty obvious what you went into. If you met measured up, you got in, and if you didn't measure up, well, that was it. Um, today it's different. Uh, the orders and the seminaries are themselves in a bit of a mess very often, and um, they have, and there are people who have what they would consider impediments in their story, and their history, the number of people who've who have a broken marriage, number of people who are over the age, number of people who, who have had experiences in their lives and who've uh, been in difficulties uh, who fit, that they feel disqualify them from, from being able to do God's work. I think we speak, of, we speak about the lack of vocations in a country like Australia. We have to face the fact, I think, that many of the religious congregations and the seminaries, you know, well, I speak of myself, I, I have to say, well, I don't think if I was a young fellow, I'd, I'd be terribly interested in joining them. Not very inspiring. Either so organized or so sort of secularized or so rich, uh, so removed from what we see the life of Jesus in the gospel is that um, well as I say I speak for myself I, uh, I don't think I'd be very attracted if I was a young person to join seminaries the same thing some of our seminaries in Australia are, are not very good news and um, one of them I know uh, in one of the states, uh, it's well known in that city, uh, there's a big problem of, of drink among the seminarians and it's not difficult to know why. They don't know what they are. I met a young man from that seminary who was just a year or two away from ordination and he said, you know, I don't know what it is to be, what it means to be a priest. All those years gone through, doesn't know what it means to be a priest. I mean, they taught everything, psychology, uh, sociology, uh, political theories, uh, everything in your life, except what is really the heart of the gospel and the spiritual ministry. And so, no wonder they drink. Uh, uh, they know that it's, it, that's not what it really is, what it's all about. And yet that's what's given to them, and if they, if they question it, well, they're, they're out or they're... Uh, so, you know, it's, um, uh, and yet what is God doing? It seems very, very clear to me that God is, there's a movement of the Spirit where God's working at another level. Uh, there's a tremendous sort of a, a movement of the Spirit. 
people coming together to pray, people coming together to to learn the gospel and the and, and the spirit of Jesus, people coming together to care in little ways for their neighbour who's underprivileged, in need, lonely, sad, broken. Go around all the parishes, all the missionary orders, uh, all sorts of works of caring, and you find this, this these bands of people who are there doing all the sort of the little things. You know, working in opportunity shops or uh, St. Vincent de Paul groups and collecting things and... Uh, uh, going to prayer meetings, uh, all the little things. There's a whole host of people uh, like that all around the country uh, doing these beautiful things. And many are searching and seeking uh, uh, and don't find the way. People who've got their own broken hearts and their own brokenness, uh, widows, separated people, people who've retired, people who've been in all sorts of strife and difficulties and uh, carry their wounds and their brokenness in various ways and uh, we're, we're, God's moving there but I believe I really believe that we're waiting for a new Francis of Assisi to sort of move out and inspire this army of, 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 of beautiful people uh, people who who don't make it in terms of all the you know the the, the elites and the theology, theology schools and the spirituality courses who aren't there, but there's this army waiting for that for that Francis of Assisi today, who will go back to the gospel simplicity, to the prayer, to that living faith in Jesus who works miracles. You know, our seminaries and spirituality courses are teaching us that miracles didn't really happen. He didn't really do miracles. You know, and it's explained away in one way or another. Somebody, some little boy came and he had a few fish and everybody else was inspired to give their fish and their bread and uh, uh, he didn't, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead and he's not really present in the Blessed Sacrament and Mary's not really a virgin and Bethlehem didn't really happen. You know, that all that negative scripture stuff that, you know, at the end, who's going to follow that? Only people who can get a good job out of uh, professing all that stuff. And, and it, it's way over the heads of little people. Thank God. You know? Thank God. They're, they're safe. <laughs> <laughs> but sad to say, our seminarians, students... Uh, attending programs, uh, so many spirituality courses. This is the stuff that's fed out. Huh? You see people like Jean Vanier and Mother Teresa in our day who've, who've gone ahead and do all the beautiful things. You know, they're not running around saying Jesus didn't do miracles and he didn't do this and he's not present in the Blessed Sacrament. They, they haven't got time for all that. And they don't believe it. They believe in miracles. That's why they go out and start doing impossible things. Because they believe that Jesus will be with them. And so we really are at a, a special time in the church uh, where, where there's, we're really waiting for this breakthrough. And it's, it's already happening. You know, our, our gathering here for the retreat. Uh, this is where you find it. Who are we here? You know, just look around. Uh, where... I don't think we've got any theologians here. Hmm? <laughs> they, uh, I, I certainly don't get any theologians on my retreats. They never come. <laughs> they don't come anywhere near me. <laughs> but you know, the life is here. Huh? Uh, you feel the life and the warmth. Here's Betty with Grace Wood and... You know, she's the whole thing sort of going with a rubber band just uh, <laughs> held together. And, and that's where these, you know, that's, that's really what it was. That was Nazareth. That was Bethlehem. That was the, the hidden life of Jesus and the twelve apostles. It's all a rubber band job. And, and that's the wonder. Because it's that, then we can see and recognize, you know, it has to be God in it. 
otherwise uh, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't last uh, any time and so the gospel and Jesus uh, to really go into it and, and, and to embrace the way in which he can with all our brokenness with all our littleness you know the wonderful thing there is Henry Nouwen pointed out we have in Christ uh, a God who identifies himself by his wounds he says to them there when he comes in after the resurrection see my wounds see my hands put your touch my wounds you know that Christ identifies himself to us by his wounds we who are wounded we who have our own wounds you know wounds don't and don't disqualify us our wounds are almost our qualifications and this is the surprise of the gospel and so we um, we try to wonder at, at, at Christ our Lord and to hear the call that comes to us whatever our stories might be whatever our circumstances or situations may be Jesus calls us just as we are and he builds his church out of the little people and he even gives to to his little people his wounded people his Mary Magdalene's with all their story he gives to them this this beautiful role Jesus changes a prostitute into a saint he changes a corrupt tax collector into into an evangelist and there's there's a place for me whatever my circumstances may be and that's the joy of it all and who would ever do it this way except God you know no no sane person starting any movement or organization or business would ever start off like that but Jesus that's where Jesus goes starting with Mary of Nazareth little unknown Mary in hidden Nazareth who was betrothed to Joseph the carpenter there that's the choice of, of, of our Lord uh, and we all get a place as a result <laughs>